Hello. Just to say that we are, they are still in finishing the plenary now, and so we wait for another five more minutes, and then uh, we begin. Please do not disappear. <laughs>
good afternoon. Uh, sorry, we we have to begin a little bit later because of people who are still in, in the plenary. So every, first of all, let me welcome you all uh, to this session on uh, open standard for managing parliamentary document case study in the use of semantic technologies. And I just wanted, to, uh, first of all, my name is Flavio Zeni. I work for uh, a UNDESA project in Africa called Africa I Parliament Action Plan. Uh, that is a project to support the, the use of ICT in African Parliament. And we actually also have developed in the course of the last uh, three or four years uh, a standard for parliamentary and legislative document that we will present in the second session. Uh, briefly, I wanted to exp explain the, the reason behind having this session about open uh, document format. Uh, as you know, as you may know, in the first e-Parliament conference last year, it was widely acknowledged that op open document format are a good thing for Parliament for, for, for many reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, as we have seen in the World E-Parliament report, very few Parliament uh, actually use XML. But this is every good thing. Very few people do them. So that's not, uh, this is not an exception. But we thought that this year, we wanted to try to move a little bit ahead and, and present a concrete case where XML has been working and hearing from the different experience done, what are the obstacles, what are the issues, what are uh, the requirements in terms of um, the organization of work and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is the reason we, uh, the, the afternoon actually is divided in two because in the first session we are talking more about uh, uh, con concrete example of standards and uh, on the second part we are talking about how the standard can play not just in the national context but in a regional context what kind of role they can play and what kind of uh, objective they can uh, they can achieve so let me uh, give the floor Im immediately to the first uh, a presenter, that is Kirsten Gulikson from the House of Representatives of the United States of America. And uh, what I just wanted to say that the objective of this uh, parallel section is also to come up with some recommendation on things that we could do together to further the case of uh, open uh, document format uh, in Parliament. Please. Thank you for the in introduction. Again, my name is Kirsten Gulikson. I'm a nonpartisan support staff member in the United States House of Representatives. And we have been working on a multi-year, multi-phase project to get all of our legislative documents in XML. And so I've been asked to present a little bit about how we did that. And I'm also going to have time to demonstrate our application for you. We do have an editing application um, to edit our bills, resolutions, and amendments. Following a feasibility study, the United States House and the United States Senate customized a separate XML editor for drafting bills, resolutions, and amendments. We did this by creating a document type definition or a DTD that we agreed upon th through the legislative branch and we use that to draft our legislation and also publish our legislation. We uh, do this through a joint e um, effort through the House, the Senate, and two other organizations in our legislative branch, the Government Printing Office as well as the Library of Congress. Our government printing office is in charge of publishing all of our documents, and the um, Library of Congress is in charge of posting that um, legislation on a public website for the public, as well as adding additional ed information about our legislative process. We did create a technical working group between our ledge branch organizations to manage our DTD or our schema, as well as we manage our common tag library. We thought it was really important that we use the same XML elements or tags across not only our documents, but across our databases. So wherever we can, we use the same um, element and tag um, across our, again, across our documents and our databases. Our editing environment is a customized off-the-shelf software product, product called XMetal. It's, um, produced by the company called Just Systems. We went with XMetal because it was affordable. It uses common development languages, and it provides a fully featured tags off editing environment. You can see, see by the slide that we don't see any XML tags or elements. 
we really wanted our authors to be able not to see the XML elements. Our main customizations are written in VBScript, Perlscript, and dynamic link libraries. Our IT staff was trained in Perl and Visual Basic, so we thought it was really important to be able to find an editor um, that they could customize and we wouldn't have to incur the training costs. We have three main drafters in the House. We have the House Ledge Council, our House Enrolling Clerks, and our Government Printing Office. They all use our XML application to um, work with the XML documents. Um, the Legislative Council is our main drafting arm. They work for the members of Congress and draft the legislation. They work very extensively with us on customizing the editor. Our enrolling clerks, they en um, produce the enrolled bill. The enrolled bill um, goes to the president, and when the president signs it, our bill is then enacted into law. As well, again, the government printing office is in charge of publishing and producing a paper copy of our legislation. In the United States Congress, the paper version is our official document of record. So all of our folks who use our XML editor need to be able to produce a paper copy. Um, we do this by working in the XML editor. Then we have to um, com translate or convert the XML down to a proprietary typesetting coded file. And then that we still use an old composition engine to take that proprietary typesetting code and make a PDF document. All of that software is installed on the local workstation. It's hidden from our users, but we do have to um, do that conversion. And it, it was expensive and it's time consuming. And as XSLT and other uh, um, technologies mature, we really have the goal of taking that XML document and being able to convert it right to the PDF. Our document workflow can be pretty complex, but it also can be very simple. We take our XML document and it goes from the U.S. House of Representatives to the Government Printing Office and then we post it for, to the Library of Congress. When we're working with the XML document, our authors again draft in um, the XML editor in XMetal. You can see that on the screen. We transmit that XML document to the Government Printing Office. They actually, the Government Printing Office will produce the paper version. Um, there were samples at the table but the GPO produces the, the paper copy. And then we trans, um, transmit the XML document over to a public website to the Library of Congress, and they post it again on the public website. Before we post the XML file of the bill, we do run a value-added script on it. Where in that value-added script, we add links to any public law citations or any United States Code citation. So we're adding value and links into the XML document, as well as we add the Dublin Core metadata to the top of the document. And this improves the searchability of our XML documents. The goals for drafting for us in XML, not only did we want to achieve our institutional goals of being able to um, produce documents in different formats, um, and having the, the searchability that you get with using XML. But we really wanted to minimize our drafters' attention to the typesetting code. In their old uh, editing application, they really had to learn typesetting or formatting codes or style codes. So we really wanted to uh, let them focus on the legislation itself. We also wanted to provide a tags-off environment. We did not want to have to trade one set of codes for another set of codes. And we wanted to get them in a Windows environment. They were familiar with it, and so we wanted to reduce our training effort. Very quickly, this is what their old editing environment looked like. Very <laughs> complicated. You can't even find the legislative language inside that screen. Um, again, we provided them with this nice uh, editing environment. This slide illustrates some of the complexity of our federal legislation. Our federal legislation is very hierarchical. Our basic unit is a section, and then underneath the section we can have several, seven different um, hierarchies, a subsection paragraph, um, subparagraph. And we really thought it was important when we created our XML schema to keep that relationship. And so all of our levels, or our, our um, legislative provisions are nested. There's a uh, parent-child relationship there. And that really gave us the ability to provide some more context-sensitive editing features.
So our goal, again, was to really provide some smart editing or smart authoring and context-sensitive functions in the editor. And so some of those features are auto-renumbering, auto-regeneration of table of contents, and the ability to move our legislative structures around. So I'll quickly show you some of those features. This is what the XML environment looks like. Um, the sample bill that you have in paper is here on XML. And according to our business rules, um, when we get to a, a subsection, after the subsection, you can only put three different legislative provisions, and you can either put a section, a subsection, or a paragraph. So when I go here to the end of this subsection, and I just hit the simple keystroke of an enter, the drafter will get another subsection. You can see that we already put the designator or the enumerator in, which is the B, and then we have what we call text markers for the header and the text, and the user can type in their legislative language there, um, and so it's context sensitive. Down here we can do some lower levels. When you get to the end, it tells you you can't go beyond that because it's beyond our scope of good drafting. <laughs> um, but the editor knows that at the end of this subsection, we can put in a various numbers of levels. And so if the user can pick, pick which one they want to go in, and they can insert a header. The other, th the other thing that we thought was really important um, all of our legislation, all the legislative provisions can have headers in them, and our headers print out in different formats. Some of the headers print out in all cap, some of them print in cap and small cap, and so in order to alleviate the drafters um, having to know all of those typesetting rules, we just ask them to type in normal sentence casing. And so our print engine knows that our section heads are print in all cap, our subsection headers print in cap and small cap, and so that really um, prevents us from having to, to train or for having the drafters to memorize that. So what were some of our lessons learned? We learned that you can use XML to actually draft your legislation. You still can have the institutional goals of version control, consistent formatting and searchability, but really improve the author's ability to draft. With auto renumbering and with getting away from typesetting, you can really improve your document and get rid of some of the administrative chores. We also learned that authors don't like to work in a structured editor. We really do try to make sure that the editor is conforming to the business rules of how our legislative legislation is drafted. So they don't like to, to lose that free form that you get in, a, in Word or WordPerfect. Um, but after a while, they got used to it. <laughs> We also learned that we can provide a tags off environment so that your drafters don't have to become IT folk or they don't need to learn the XML, that they can really work in a tags off environment. Um, I just have a little bit more time. I just wanted to let you know of some other technologies that we're using in the legislative branch. The Library of Congress is um, taking all of our documents and putting handles on them, and so that's going to give us persistent identifiers. So if a user um, knows the URL or the, the naming convention of the handle, they can easily find a legislative document, as well as our government printing office is um, starting to use digital signatures in all of our federal government documents. Our, our libraries in the U.S. And, and our public has been asking for authentication for our documents, and so this is just a way for them to confirm that, that the document is really from the, the government. For more information, we post all of our DTDs or our schemas online for the public, and that's at xml.house.gov. We also have our common tag library posted for the public, and so if they're actually looking at our XML files, they can know the definitions and of not only our elements, but the attributes that are being used. And uh, the Thomas website, the, LO, the Library of Congress's website, is also up there. They do post all of our XML files, and to date we have 22,000 XML files available to the public. If anyone has any questions or wants to see some further functionality of the application, I'm available after the session. So. Actually, since you have been so good, you still have three or four minutes if anybody wants to. <laughs> thank you. To, first of all, thank you very much for, for the very interesting presentation. Then I don't know. If you want, we can have a question at the end, but if you have any urging one to, 
that you want to put now. Yes, please, a short one, hopefully. Yes. Muy corto. Marcar las intervenciones de los MPs. Just, just, just hold on. They have to put on the, okay. the headphone, the headset. Eh, si, si marcan las intervenciones de los parlamentarios. No, could you start again? Mm -hmm. yes. If you mark the MPs' oh. uh, uh, the interventions. Yeah. We haven't done our debate section yet. Um, if uh, there's other parliaments who are doing their debate section, I'd love to see your XML. I think that's going to be our most challenging, is putting the debate section in the XML. Um, our debate section is in a big book called the Congressional Record, and there's lots of different components to that that we have not tackled yet. We, uh, our project started about 10 years ago with the most simplest documents, which are, were our resolutions, and then we moved into more complex legislative structure. We are just bringing on committee reports next year. Um, we should. We just completed bills, resolutions, and amendments. Does that help? Let's let's move. A very short one, please. If it's a comment, we do it at the end. No, it's a question. Question à propos du processus d'élaboration des documents. Une question à propos du processus d'élaboration des documents. À quel moment les métadatas sont-elles construites oh. The metadata is created at two points. Our drafters can actually create the metadata if they know the name of the sponsor or the member who's actually drafting it. Sometimes they draft the legislation and they don't actually know who's going to sponsor it. Um, but when the bill is introduced into the House floor, then the office that I work for, the Office of the Clerk, is in charge of putting the bill number, the uh, date that it's introduced in the file. We have a process in the background. Um, they enter the data into a management tracking system, and then we read the data out of that and populate the XML file for the legislation. Then before we post the XML file to the public, we add additional metadata. So after we're done with the legislative process and the bill is ready to be published, we put the metadata on. Does that help? Okay. okay, thank you very much, Christine, again. And now it's uh, Sergio Falcao of the Chamber of Deputy of Brazil. Sergio, even you try to be as good as Christine. Uh, I'll try, I'll try. Thank you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, i talk about the XML, the LexML initiative. Uh, we are taking out right now in Brazil and we, and we are working together with the Federal Senate, the other legislative house, and the, the person behind all this is João Lima, which some of you might know, and we are doing a, a job together right now. I'll talk about that, okay? Uh, first of all, a little of context. Brazil is a large country, 190 million people, a big, large area. We have 27 states and 5,500 municipalities. So, uh, we have an estimated number of laws of uh, 150,000 at the federal law, federal level, uh, up close to 1 million at the state level, and 2.5 million at the municipal level. So, citizens, <laughs> how do they know what law they have to follow, right? It's a, it's a big confusion. So, we try to help on this. Well, the LexML initiative in Brazil is a joint effort from some federal agencies. We are working together, and we establish and adopt open standards. We establish when we don't have any ready for us, and we adopt when they already exist. Uh, we try to integrate workflows uh, and, and process, and we want to share information between uh, those agencies and with the citizens. And the LexML is about uh, identifying some documents and to structure the, those documents. The identification, the single identification, the, the only one is made through URN. It's a permanent uh, identifier of the document. I'll show you how. And the structure of the document is based on XML code. Okay? 
and we are handling legislative and juridical information, some court decisions as well. Okay, that's the scope. Well, we are based on uh, other standards, like Coma Natoso, Norm Ingrete, Italy, and Metalex, all from Europe. And we learned from them. My colleague, João Lima, uh, spent some time here, in, in, not here, in Italy, and studied all that, and we learned a lot from those standards. So we are not making uh, some brand new stuff, just improving something. Okay, uh, the LexML effort is about, uh, we have already schemas ready for legislative propositions, uh, laws, and jurisprudence, which are court decisions, at three levels, federal, state, and municipal level. And both, and for the legislative, the justice and the executive. At this moment, we are working together, uh, people from uh, agencies from leg legislative and justice. And I'll show you in a few minutes. Well, uh, last Thursday, the first uh, page, our first search page went to the air, so it's brand new. And at this moment, we are working uh, the Federal Senate, where John Lima works, Chamber of Deputies, the Accounting Office, General Accounting Office of the Government, and the Supreme Court. We are beginning to publish some documents in this environment. And right now we have about 90,000 references. We just start this week. And as we gain moment, we pay to reach February 2009, so a few months in advance. Well, we want to reach one million documents. Those are documents that already existed. So we are converting some reference to those documents and publishing it. Uh, that's how the metadata harvesting schema works. Uh, we use the same protocol as digital libraries. And we have a central repository with all this metadata that comes from the, for example, the Federal Senate, House of, of Representatives, Chamber of Deputies, Supreme Court, and others. We can also have some aggregation level, for example, for state laws. So uh, we can have some, some other publishers. And it's very important that, for example, in Chamber of Deputies, we, have, we can have, for example, three areas that publish information. Uh, for example, one for the laws, uh, and we identify the area which publishes, and the person with his email and telephone number. So if you have doubts about the information that's published, you can send an email, for example, and ask for some more information. And so we identify all the areas and the people responsible in those areas for the uh, information that is published. This is our page. Sounds, uh, looks familiar, right? And we don't want to invent anything different. And let me show you online. Okay, this is the real page. For example, uh, if I type a uh, number of a very popular law, which is this is the law about uh, procurement in government. So it's very used. It. Uh, when I search here, I have uh, this is the search result page. We have some facets here. For example, this is the federal. Uh, it's, it's about Brazil. All, all the reference are in the federal level. We could have municipal and state level also. And we have legislative propositions that want to change that law somehow. And we also have the law itself. And we can search by year, for example, also. So you can uh, change the, the criteria for the search as you, you look for the results. Here, the first reference is the law itself, here, the reference to the law. Here we have a small summary, and this is the permanent link to, the, to it. So anyone who uses the syntax can have a permanent link to it. Uh, let's look at this. I'll click here. Uh, just a moment. Let's come back here. Here we have other reference, for example. Uh, we have here a proposition that's on the Senate that wants to change this law. 
So the user, the citizen, can see the law itself and the, the propositions that want to change that law. that are not yet ready. And you can also see some court decisions that were based on this law. So you can see the law before, during, and the interpretation of the law. Okay. Okay, I want to see this, the text of this law. Here I have a more complete reference, and I know the, uh, the law is available both on the Chamber and on the Federal Senate. Okay, and I know it's HTML. Could be a PDF, for example, could be in other formats, right? So the citizen, the, the searcher, know which format it's in. And honey, click. Now I open, so, so those are all based on metadata information. Now I'm going to the, our site, website, in camera. So I read the, the primary document right now. Here I have our page with this, this law. I have some more information. And I have the actual, the, the real text and the, the original one that was published. Let's see the, it. I have all the, the reference, all the, what happened? If I open here. And finally, ta -ta -ta -ta. okay, this is a file uh, with the complete text of the law, with all the, the format, everything. So in the second phase, uh, this is working with the reference part of the program. Uh, after that, we work on the XML schemas to have the full document on XML, right? So we don't depend on this proprietary formats. So here is the, hopefully a, f a happy citizen looking and reading what he has to, to obey, right? The full text. So uh, that's what I want to show you. Uh, we just began last Thursday, as I said, with this, this search engine, and we hope to reach uh, one million reference in February. And after that, uh, we have uh, after that we have the, the, f the full contents. We we'll begin to translate into XML, okay, with cross references. And um, uh, it, it's. Uh, this initiative is very good to, to locate, to search, and to visualize the documents, but also to uh, long-term preservation, because we are using open standards. Uh, we don't depend on any uh, closed formats. And we have a permanent link to information that's very important for digital information, we have permanent link. So we can have cross-reference, and they all work together in many, many years from now. We don't depend on physical address of the document. And also the XML, which is a text format, simple text, is very good for preservation also. Uh, we, are, we are just thinking to, uh, beginning to study how to package the XML into a PDF A format, which is uh, a ISO standard for long-term preservation with dig the digital signature, and also with a timestamp package in a single PDF file. But that's for next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. Again, we have uh, a few minutes if for a couple of questions, if any. If not, we go. Yes, please. Um, what kind of XML editor do you use? Sorry, what time? The XML editor. Are the authors using an XML editor to produce the documents? No, as I said, we just handled the reference part of it at the moment. The documents are unchanging. Uh -huh. So uh, they, they're producing Word at the moment? Or? Yes. And we, we use both OpenOffice and Microsoft Word at this moment. But I know the Federal Senate is already working on an XML editor. And we think that during... Okay, thanks. Yes. You're you're using a you're using a content management system along with your XML to generate um, your your data for your web pages. Uh, not really. Uh, some of the documents, like the proposition, are stored on a, a relational database, MS SQL, SQL, but. 
next year, in January, we are beginning a two-year uh, project to buy and, and use our enterprise content management system. So today, we have documents in different databases, in different spaces. Beginning next year, we are going to centralize the store and use standard formats also. The, can I have the same question to, um, I, f I forgot your name. Are you, are you populating the, the website using a content management system or you, you're using straight XML? No, we don't have a content management system yet. Um, the government printing office is working on one and so we hope to be able to use a search engine like we just saw where you can pull up all the documents across the legislative and the executive branch. Okay. I, I'm, for, I'm forgetting what technologies they're using to do that, but maybe by the end of the presentation I'll remember. <laughs> I am from the, uh, sorry, um, I forgot to mention, I am the information systems manager for the Office of the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we have an uh, extensive amount of data that we also need to manage and make it available to the public. So um, that's why I was, currently we're working, we're trying to work a content management system and referencing documents that we have in PDFs. So that's why I asked. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, uh, when you speak, say your name and your organization. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, C'est Abdou Moussa. Uh, Merci, Monsieur le Président. Je m'appelle Abdou Moussa de, de l'Assemblée nationale du Niger. Alors, euh, je vais faire un mixage entre le premier et le deuxième intervenant parce qu'il y a deux technologies qui se ressemblent. Euh, pour le, le second intervenant, euh, il y a un schéma qui utilise un protocole très connu, l'OIPMH, avec un harvester euh, un peu mieux. Ça veut dire que, euh, à la longue, parce que dans son schéma, je ne vois pas où intervient le journal officiel, euh, tel que le premier intervenant l'avait présenté. Là où se trouve euh, chez nous le secrétaire général du gouvernement, donc celui qui a l'initiative des projets de texte, et le Parlement lui-même. Alors, euh, pour compléter, pour compléter euh, la première démarche, qui consiste à prendre trois organismes différents qui ont tous les mêmes objectifs. Est-ce qu'on ne pourrait pas tendre, pour le cas du Brésil, vers une facilitation de l'accès à l'information pour un internaute lambda, un citoyen lambda, qui souhaiterait voir un texte dès son initiation à son adoption par le Parlement et à sa promulgation par l'exécutif. Alors, ça veut dire que on pourrait utiliser le harvester pour donner l'URI ou accéder à ces trois euh, documents. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Merci. Do you have to? Do you want to? No, I think the, 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 the essence was that since uh, uh, Parliament is, is just in between, let's say, is not the one that most of the time begin the process and is not the one that co close the process, you were thinking that they should be try to, to, to integrate uh, and to have uh, and to be able to track from the very beginning to the very end okay. uh, the processes. What are you doing to integrate? I just wanted to say that Government organization, they never work together, so there is no, <laughs> they don't have the same purpose. We all know that, you know, it's a myth that we should immediately disregard. Please. We, well, most of the initiatives uh, in the legislative process comes from the, the house itself, but the most important come from the executive. And we, we are already working with them. They send the documents electronically to us, digitally, but uh, um, it's not, uh, the, the official document uh, is sent by paper and signed yet. 
but we have also a digital copy so we can publish in the internet immediately for example and we have some some agreements right now and but first we are going to integrate the two houses the senate and the chamber so we can exchange the the propositions and we are uh, we we will do this beginning next year also with XML standard. So we are working together on that. Okay, uh, but it's a long-term effort. It takes a longer time to, to bring things together. But we want to do in the end. We want to reach a situation where all the the life cycle is uh, of the document is digital, only digital, with dig digital signature and um, based on open standards. Okay, um, unless, Kristen, you wanted to add something briefly? No. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Sergio. And now is the turn of uh, uh, Richard, that is from uh, Parliament of United Kingdom. I don't know if you are House of uh, represent. I go and... I'll, I'll explain that while you're getting the summary. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Richard Ware from PICT, which is the joint department of both houses of parliament in the United Kingdom, created just three years ago. And um, my job in uh, PICT is to be director of programs and projects. So what I'm going to try to give you is more of an overview of a number of different project areas um, and the strategy that lies behind them and some of the obstacles we've faced. There is a longer version of the presentation, which I understand will be published on the, on the website, and I have a few copies here, which has more technical detail in it. So um, the, the slides today are just the, the summary, really, of the, of the strategy. Um, I think we can almost take it for granted that open standards is the right direction to go in. We've all been saying that for many years. Uh, I myself wrote a report on the subject more than five years ago for the British Parliament, and it said then what we say now, which is that open standards are the way forward for publication because for all the good reasons that it, they facilitate the exchange of documents both within the institution and between institutions. They improve the uh, possibility of searching uh, the documents. They enable all the different forms of dissemination, including very importantly now <laughs> web dissemination, which is quite different from the traditional printed document dissemination. Uh, they're more efficient, and they can, uh, as a colleague has, has already mentioned, they can support digital preservation. So we all know it's the right direction, and yet we haven't made very much progress. And uh, looking at the, the World E-Parliament report, the United Kingdom is one of the parliaments which has made a lot of progress in publishing its documents. We have a great deal of information, a very topical information on the website, but very little of it uses truly open standards. So I just wanted to pause for a moment on some of the reasons for that. Why has it taken us so long? And the main reason is that our processes are still very much geared to print publication. And this is deeply embedded, I think, in the parliamentary culture, if you like, in the parliamentary psychology of, of printed documents, which means that even where we have used XML, we've used XML mainly to do the old-fashioned job of typesetting in a slightly smarter way. So we've used XML to, to say when it should be bold and when it should be italics and when it's set in from the margin, but we haven't used it with the full capability of semantic content. Um, parliaments are quite risk-averse, so they don't like to take a leap in the dark. And the, the technology has felt quite immature until quite recently. So there's been a reluctance to do things very differently. We feel that in the British Parliament we have that opportunity now because for the first time with the creation of PICT we have a single organization which is thinking about the use of ICT to originate, to manage, to search, to disseminate our documents. Previously, this was the work of many different departments. So it's an opportunity to bring things together. And we're trying to persuade all of our colleagues across both houses of parliament to take an overview, to see the benefits of doing this as a, a joined up program. And the benefits are that we can get that seamless flow of information from one system to another system. 
with standards which are interoperable and then with the commonality of standards which allows us to, to publish to the world. Um, the other opportunity we have by treating this as a two or three year program of work is to reuse the expertise so that when we've had people develop one system that deals with one part of the parliamentary documentation, we can then reuse those skills and that experience for another part. So we use a modular approach and, and build up gradually to the point that we reach what I'll call in a moment the promised land. But before I describe what the promised land looks like as a vision, um, we have to remember that if we're going to persuade parliaments to do this work, there are some other things that have to work as well. Um, I don't know what it's like for colleagues in other countries, but we are constantly being told that our systems must never break. Parliament must always work. There must be no interruptions, so no risks. So whenever we in introduce a new system, we have to be extremely cautious and design a very clever cutover to the new system. We have to go on being flexible. We mustn't build systems that are fixed because members of parliament change their processes. They change procedures quite frequently in the United Kingdom. So our systems have to be able to move with that flexibility and sometimes move very quickly. Um, we must make sure at, at all times that we have that essential business continuity and we must spend money responsibly. So we have to be quite careful before we make major investments in uh, possibly risky technologies. But provided that we can do all of those things, we believe that there is a very strong business case for using open standards for parliamentary publication. So if we could just turn to the, I think we've really passed that one, to the, the vision. I mentioned XML, we've all talked about XML. XML has to be at the heart of the vision. Um, and the beauty of it is that it's so versatile. We can use it in so many different ways to label, to tag our information, whether it's structured information or unstructured, whether it's in documents, databases, or data repositories. And we have to focus on the content rather than the format. We were very preoccupied with the format in the past. So, yes, it's, it's XML with XML query as the, the language we use to interrogate the databases. We build towards a service-oriented architecture. We're entirely committed to W3C standards. We are committed to eventually publishing our, all of our XML uh, in a repository or set of repositories. Um, and we wish to create reusable XML at the earliest possible point in the process. Um, and we will follow international open standards wherever we can and importantly, encourage the people we work with to do the same. And colleagues have already talked about the, work, the fact that governments have a major stake in the production of uh, legislation. That's certainly the case in the United Kingdom. So at the moment, uh, we don't have an opportunity yet to do this work with bills. We will need to work harder with our colleagues in government to get a project going jointly with them on that subject. So we can't do it all in one go, and I said before our strategy is to do it in a modular way, a little bit at a time. We have now got a route map and a strategy, um, and as part of that activity, we have now set up an inter enterprise architecture board, which means that every time there is a new project in this field, it has to submit its proposals to the enterprise architecture board and explain w which standards it's going to use and they must be the open standards, at least on a strategic basis. Sometimes we have to allow for a tactical, short-term solution. We may not be able to achieve that. So we sometimes give a dispensation, but it's a time-limited dispensation. Our aim is to follow the standards entirely. There's an issue we still have to resolve, which um, I'd be interested to hear other colleagues' views on, as to whether as part of the strategy, we should have one repository, ultimately, for all our XML. At the moment, we're gradually building a number of different databases which are interoperable and which can all be queried by XML query, potentially. So that's, that's a, an architecture decision that we still have to make. Where do we start with this? Um, one of our most promising projects um, 
is the one on, on the screen at the moment. It's called Votes and Proceedings. I have to explain in the quaint terminology of the British Parliament, this is not actually a document about voting or voting lists. It's a document which describes the formal decisions of the House of Commons. So in some ways, it's the most important document of all. It's produced every day that the House sits. And just at this very moment, we are bringing into being uh, a new tool to write that document um, using X-Metal. It sounds quite similar to, to what Kirsten has just described. It's a writing tool which embeds XML at the point of origination. And it goes live next week with the state opening of Parliament. So wish us luck, please. We hope it works. Uh, <laughs> that is just the first stage. The, the, that will be an internal writing tool. The, the, the next stage will be to publish it internally to our intranet. And we intend to publish it both as a daily document as, and also as an accumulating database with all the XML there. And then the third step will be to publish both of those things to the world on, on our website. Again, with the full set of XML so that other people can use it and other people can repurpose it if they, if they wish to. Um, I mentioned bills already. Um, I'll go on now. To, we talked earlier about the problem of debates. Debates is the big challenge. We already use some XML in that area, but we use it only for print purposes. So our next opportunity, it's a project we call Hansard for the Web, is to do some clever work with the feed that we have at the moment. The thing is that although we're using XML really just as a, as a print markup tool, it is possible to deduce the semantic content. If you know what the conventional template is on the printed page and you know what the format is for a member's name or the name of a bill or another procedural event, you can work backwards from that and produce an enriched XML version. It's better than nothing. It's quite expensive in terms of code because it needs some clever workarounds. But that's what we're trying to do at the moment. But that's really just a tactical project because what we intend to start doing from next year is to completely rebuild the Hansard systems, that is the debate systems, for both houses of the British Parliament using the same principles as the Votes and Proceedings project. So to design a writing tool which is easy to use um, and from which it is possible then to create a, a semantically rich XML which we can publish both internally and externally. If we could just move to the next slide. This is a quite different project. This project is about the historic volumes of parliamentary debates, and they go back to 1803. So we have 200 years, a huge data set. Now, a few years ago, we had those old volumes photographed and optical character recognition run over them so that we now have a very large digital archive. And again, some very clever people using some very clever open source software this time have found ways of working backwards from that data set to create an enriched XML data set. And this one we, we have published already. Um, I'm, I'm afraid there is a mistake on the, the summary slide because it's not actually on the main parliamentary website, which is www.parliament.uk. It's actually on um, a website called hansard.milbanksystems.com which is an experimental beta site. But it is there for everyone to see. And as uh, is usually the case with a good open source project, it's entirely open. All the, the codes that have been used are there. You can download them. You can download the XML sets if you wish to. And you can see what has been done to make that very rich database searchable. So this is another approach. And we feel at this stage that it's quite appropriate to use a variety of different approaches and to explore what we can do with different kinds of tools. One big system we have, which is not open standards at the moment, is called PIMS. It was created quite recently um, by a commercial partner working with Parliament. Um, it is intended to be the, the main searchable index to the parliamentary documentation. And 
it has been a disappointment to many people. It hasn't really done the job that it was intended to do. It was originally intended to use open standards, but that got lost somewhere along the way. So our next challenge will be to rethink that database, to rebuild it, to link it into the other projects that I've been talking about, so that that too becomes an open standard searchable system. But we're some way off doing that at the moment. So just to conclude, I think it's right to be ambitious. It's also right to be quite patient. I mean, colleagues have talked about 10 years. <laughs> it's taken us a long time to get as far as we've got. I think one of, one of the lessons we've learned is that we have to be very persistent and very patient in making the case for open standards. But I think we can make that case. We have to use the opportunities as they arise. So when a system is getting obsolescent or has to be upgraded, that's the time to, to get there quickly and propose <laughs> an XML-based system to replace it. And finally, I would say as another lesson, just keep experimenting because we're not sure that we've got all the answers yet. I'm not sure that anyone has all the answers yet. So by keeping a number of different possibilities open, hopefully in a few more years' time we'll get to that promised land. Thank you. So again, if there is a couple of questions, a very quick question. Okay. Um, Ferguson from the Trinidad and Tobago Parliament again. Um, when you, your hand, in reference to your Hansard, Mr. Weir, um, do you use any writing tools out of the Hansard? Like, for instance, the shorthand writers, the Stentura writers, um, the software that comes with it um, um, from Advantage Software, Eclipse. Uh, the output isn't um, the, to convert to like a Word document or something? At, at the moment, um, they use um, a series of Word templates, which are quite heavily adapted Word templates. Which we then have to export to XML. Yes. They don't download directly from a sound recording, because yeah. ours is a heavily edited verbatim report. So they, they use Word templates, and those have then, as I said, have print XML uh, embedded in the templates, but, but not simply XML. So um, you did not mention, I don't think you did, the, what conversion tool then are you using? Are you using any, any tools, For any the future. particular tools? Huh? For the future, do you mean? Oh, you're not doing it right now. That's no, what I... we're, we're, we're about to begin a major okay. project to rebuild the Hansard systems completely. Okay. So my assumption is that we will start off with a tool, a writing tool similar to the one that Kirsten described. But we, if, we're just starting on that. If you moment. could just mention the website you said again, um, Hansard. The experimental one, yes. It's um, uh, www.hansard.millbanksystems, that has two L's in millbanksystems.com. Thank you very much. Okay. I have, a, have some spare copies of the paper here if you're interested. Yes, okay. please. Thanks. Gunther, please. Thank you. I'd also like to refer to the um, historical Hansard uh, project. Um, on one hand, it seems to be quite important to deal with, this, uh, with these issues as well, just having in mind what the Speaker of the Pan-African Parliament told us about legacy. All of us have mm -hmm. so much legacy to deal with in, in Parliament, and that's something we shouldn't forget about um, when... Uh, uh, than more or less focusing on producing new content. Mm. Uh, so um, at the same time, in the Austrian Parliament, we are preparing a project that would try to, uh, to automatically structure uh, this legacy content in XML. We try to, uh, to use um, tools that would enable us to add uh, tagging, XML tagging, to um, uh, scan and then OCR. Uh, read um, historical uh, stenographic records, as we call the Hansard. So uh, that's why I would like to uh, learn more about your project. In what way uh, you uh, intend to um, to add uh, structure to the content that you are digitizing? Mm. Okay, Enrico, please twenty seconds. You. Uh, 
Um, if I take the first question first, um, the best answer is to go to the website, and I, and, and, and I can give you further details of the people who've created it. it, it as an open source website, it, it has a Google group, it has discussion groups, so it's, and everyone is very welcome to join in those discussions. So uh, I can give you further details if, if you wish. And I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the, whether, whether we use a, a standard system of URLs for... Uh, if, uh, I'm, I was uh, uh, wondering if you are uh, using a URI, URI URN uh, standard to identify uh, documents together with uh, the adoption of XML. I would have to refer that question to my colleagues, I'm afraid. It's okay. too, too much detail for me. Uh, <laughs> as, as, no, as in the, in the Brazilian uh, yes. uh, experience, uh, they have used uh, URN uh, standards yes. to identify documents, so I was... Uh, Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, there was another intervention, but we will, there is going to be a space for the debate later on. Now I give uh, the, the, the floor to Choi Jin Ho, more or less, sorry, I apologize, for a presentation from the, uh, from the um, Republic of Korea uh, National Assembly. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I will briefly introduce uh, our e parliament system to you. And if you have any uh, cementing technological uh, question, Mr. Hong is an engineer, software engineer in charge of it, could answer your questions. I would like to begin my presentation with the background of our e-parliament, why we came up with uh, such an idea and then provide you uh, with more information on the digital printed chamber and the information system of the Korean National Assembly. The internet enables everybody to acquire real-time information on the process of drafting new policies and create more opportunity for people to participate in policy decision-making processes. That's why people expect and demand the parliament to provide a sweeper and more accurate information on policies that could affect their interest. The role of, uh, of the National Assembly in the policy making process in Korea becomes stronger, especially compared to the past. The prime example is that Assembly members are entitled to pro propose the bills. In the 16th National Assembly in 2000, there are a total 2,000 bills proposed by the members, but the number jumped to 6,400 bills in the 17th National Assembly in 2004. The 18th National Assembly, which is started out in the second half of this year, is already recording more than 1,600 bills to date. Uh, in, in order to address the elevated status of the National Assembly, The rising number of bills, the enhance in the demand and expectation of our people toward the parliament, and continuing progress in ICT, the National Assembly pursued the establishment of the e-parliament. The cement web is the essence of the core technology which empowered e-parliament. And it comes to life, the digital chamber and the information system of the National Assembly. I would like to begin with the introduction of the uh, digital plenary ch chambers, which was created to facilitate parliamentary proceedings. We installed a computer terminal for each of the 299 members of the assembly in the plenary chamber. By using this computer terminal, assembly members can search real-time information on bills and budget proposals and participate in electronic voting. The results of the votes are immediately displayed in the electronic vote at the front of the chamber and stored in the database. The personal terminals installed in each member's seat operate a program that uses semantic technology. For this system, the Korean National Assembly uses UCI Universal and Ubiquitous Content Identifier, and URN, 
universal resource names. UCI has been applied to all information necessary for the deliberation of bills, such as bills, meeting minutes, and the info, uh, deliberation of bills, information for such administration inspection, budget then settlement of account. This helps us to systematically manage all of our data and timely provide the necessary information during proceedings. We spend more, uh, about a total of $8 million in the automatic bills processing system and the digital plenary chamber. Going forward, we plan to apply UCI to all of our committees so that every phase from the proposal of bills to the making of decisions will become digital in the future. The National Assembly offers real-time information on the parliamentary activities and legislation to the public. The information system is also based on cement web technology, and it cost around $3.5 million to build for five years. The information system has five systems. The legislative knowledge and information system is a systematic collection of current laws and ordinances. All cases of the Supreme Court and the bill examination data. To this end, we also conclude a cooperation agreement with the Supreme Court to share information. With this system in place, people no longer have to visit several organizations and portals to acquire information on laws and cases. The ministry system and the bill information system refer to the database all meeting minutes and bills since the Constitution's Assembly of 1948. The inter inter internet broadcasting system enables people to watch current proceedings online real time and past proceedings through the video on demand. Plenary session and standing committee meetings are broadcast live through 22 channels and previous programs organized by the speakers and agenda item can be accessed by VOD. The videos of parliamentary meetings continue to draw more attention from the public, reaching more than 1 million hits in August this year. This is a 50 increase compared to the same period last year. The integrated search system for legislative content is the service that enables people to search all of the above information and the videos by one simple click. To create this environment, we apply to UCI based on XML. On all legal information, minutes, bills, and meeting videos, thereby building a user-friendly metabase metadata repository. For instance, the words law in legal system, item in minutes and meeting videos, and bill and bill information have different meanings, but are common in that they are subject to discuss at the National Assembly. Such pieces of information are connected by the fact that they are subject to deliberation and then manage as a bundle of related information. Now I will briefly work you through the integrated search system for legislative content. This is the main screen. Uh, you can see the search bar in the center. I have input the keyword, comprehensive real estate holding tax in the bar. Upon click enter, the bills, minutes and meeting videos on the process leading up to the enactment of the comprehensive real estate holding tax law are displayed. By clicking on the tag folder on the upper right hand, of, uh, right hand corner of the main screen, you will see a list of most popular related bills on the left and a list of the related knowledge on the right. 
the most popular keywords are highlighted to assist your query. Furthermore, the National Assembly concluded a cooperation agreement with the Korean number one portal engine label so that users can also access our information system through the portal services. This re resulted in a remarkable surge in the number of visits to the, our information system from 5,000 a day to 20,000 a day. The system we have installed at the National Assembly don't utilize the full potential of the cement web technology, but we are proud that we, they hold true to the spirit of the cement web, which is striving for user convenience. I have given you a simple explanation on how the Korean National Assembly uses ICT and the semantic technology to increase uh, internal efficiency and build an information system for the people. And we are the first public organization to utilize and apply this technology in Korea. Uh, we consider the level of the semantic web technology applied to our National Assembly to be on around the first or first stage, our lab, a total 10 stage. So we know that we need to make more effort to, in order to build the most desirable system. Uh, as you may know well, the current semantic technology applied to the web is not perfect. Some even say that this is only the beginning and that there are both optimistic and skeptical views on the future of this technology. Uh, nevertheless, we believe that our focus on improving users' convenience in searching information online is in the right direction. And we are confident, confident that we will be able to achieve further improving through technological innovations. Uh, we therefore will not stop here. We continue to drop, uh, develop the system instead with the advance made in semantic technology. I also believe that the exchange of experience and views between countries is very important in the establishment of e-parliament. It's bringing me to end of my, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, if there is any question related to the presentation that you want to ask now or, uh, or since we are a little bit behind schedule, thank you very much. And, uh, and I don't see anybody asking a question at the moment. It's too good for us, I think, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 poor English ability. <laughs> no, 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 in the sense the system is, is extremely good and extremely powerful that uh, you probably scared all of us, actually. <laughs> and uh, so and now I give you, I give the floor to Jan McDonald's of the House of uh, Common in Canada for the last uh, presentation of this uh, uh, section. Then uh, we will, uh, okay, then we will try to wrap up quickly uh, to move to to the next. Sorry, it'll just be a minute. Okay, thank you everyone for bearing with me. Thanks to the organizers uh, for organizing the conference uh, uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the PRISM system, uh, House of Commons in Canada. Um, I'm not sure why some of the text isn't there, but that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the PRISM system is. I'm gonna do an overview of PRISM, basically just sort of give two examples or two case studies, if you will, 
uh, one being the, as Richard mentioned, the votes and proceedings, how we do our journals, as well as how we do our Hansard. Um, uh, but I will talk a little bit about all of the different publications that we, uh, that we prepare using the PRISM system. Uh, PRISM, it's an integrated application to manage the information and publish the core business documents of the House of Commons in Canada, uh, including the journals, the votes and proceedings, the order and notice paper, which is the agenda of the House, status of House business, which is essentially, essentially a summary of all the bills and motions, uh, as well as the Hansard, and those are the ones related to the plenary sessions or the, the, uh, the, the main chamber. Uh, we, we use the same system uh, for uh, committees, so notices of committee meetings, the minutes of committee meetings, evidence, which is again the transcription like Hansard is, um, uh, the transcription of the, of the sitting, uh, as well as uh, for committee reports. We also use it for the international interparliamentary affairs. We use the same uh, database for managing all conference activities. Uh, business and membership of parliamentary associations. We track activities of official parliamentary delegations, both incoming and outgoing, and visit reports that are published to the web. And finally, we also talk about, uh, we also uh, support the authoring, publishing, and interchange uh, of bills uh, with our partners, including the Department of Justice, therefore, with the executive. Um, contrary to what was said earlier, um, we've, it took a long time, but we have uh, an interchange system an exception from the rule, yes. Um, uh, we, uh, we, re uh, we both, uh, the House of Commons uh, and the Senate in Canada, our upper house, uh, we both have um, initiatives from parliamentarians, uh, legislative initiatives from parliamentarians, and those are prepared by the respective houses, uh, but the executive also prepares uh, a great deal in, in terms of the number of pages, the bulk of the legislation. Uh, not in terms of the bulk of the bills, in fact, um, but um, we all share a common DTD, uh, and uh, even though we have different authoring systems, we share a common DTD for that. I'm not going to talk much about bills, though. I'm going to spend my time talking about uh, the journals, um, i.e. the minutes of the House of Commons, as well as Hansard. Um, but before I get there, I was just going to talk a little bit about what moved us to develop this system. We actually, uh, talking, it's kind of good to go last in some ways, because uh, sort of a lot of the things that have been been mentioned already, uh, patience, uh, um, waiting for the promised land, and I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination we've reached the promised land yet, but it does take patience. And we started this pr prison project in 1999, uh, and it had been a long time coming even at that. And one of the we had two principal reasons for starting the project back in 1999. The first one was that we had systems that were really that. Um, uh, were nearing the end of their life cycle, and we had little choice. We really did have to invest and go in a new um, go in a new direction. We could have just simply revitalized those tools uh, using new hardware. In some cases, it was the hardware that was uh, no longer supported. Um, but um, it also gave us the opportunity to start getting ready to be able to respond to future requests from parliamentarians, from the public, from the staff, even as well. Of course, our our focus is on parliamentarians. So. Uh, so the, pr the current context of PRISM is that the application now has more than 900 users. Uh, we have over 65 modules. It varies from classic record keeping, uh, simple records stored in a database, to sophisticated workflow management. And it uses a large m mixture of technologies, including SQL Server, XML, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that's really, I think it's worth mentioning is that the complexity is, of the system, and of course this is saying nothing when you're at the European Parliament where 23 languages are used, but in Canada we use both languages, English and French as authoritative languages for everything that we do, everything needs to be done bilingually, and so uh, that doesn't just make the project a, a little bit more, it doesn't just double the complexity of the project, it actually makes it far more complex as soon as you're dealing with more than one language, and uh, I can imagine that it gets more complicated with even more languages. But. Um, so the first example I'm going to talk about uh, is the journals, uh, which are the minutes of the House of Commons. And what, what we're going to see is how, wh what we do is we record every entry in a database as an event. And each event is categorized with an event type, with parameters that can be set by the user, can be adjusted by the user. And the combination of the events and the event types are used to calculate the appropriate entries uh, and creates, the, the system itself creates the tagged XML fragments. This is really important going back to some of the earlier comments. We wanted to isolate the users as much as possible from the day-to-day the -day dealing 
with the XML. Um, just, I mean, I'm originally, before I started on the project back in 1999, was actually one of the people who wrote the journals, and we wrote them in Word, but the system, we sent off the documents at the end of the night, and somebody completely deconstructed them and put them onto a mainframe, and I mean, it was quite an elaborate process, and there's people working through the night to be able to produce them for the next morning. And what we were really trying to aim for was a system where we didn't have to have that complexity, but we would still be able to uh, deliver those products uh, as quickly as we had before. This may be very difficult to see on the screen, but I'll essentially give a little overview. Um, there's the mouse. Um, so essentially what a user would do is they would just click to create a new event, and they would select an event type. So in this case, it's a decision made. So we're just recording the fact that something happened with a particular motion. The user would go and choose the motion uh, that the house had agreed to or rejected. Um, and then they would be able to fill in any of these various uh, tags, either by checking a checkbox or uh, by choosing a, a date from a calendar sort of thing, pursuant to order made on a specific date. Uh, dis uh, the decision result, if it was agreed to, if it was uh, defeated, uh, if it was tied, then you could give an explanation. Uh, and if there's any other detail, for, such as the decision uh, method, if it was by unanimous consent, if it had been agreed to automatically sort of thing. Um, then the user would save this event and they would click generate. And if they clicked the view item button, what they would see is this screen here. And this is just a simple text view of what the entry was, the entry that was automatically generated by the system with the tags intact. And in fact, if you went to the bottom, this is, uh, if you would go to the bottom here and click on ABC, click on tags view, you would be able to see this little fragment of text um, as it was generated by the system uh, with some of the tags on. And so this is a very, very simple example, but I'll show you a more complicated, I chose a simple example on purpose, uh, but I'll show you a more complicated one in just a moment. Um, so this is the tool that the people who would be working on the journals or the minutes of the house would use. And in fact, and I'll come back to this in just a moment, but this is a list of all, all the events that are interventions. So every time a member gets up to speak in the house, we record that. And I'll show you how, we, how that's done when I give a demonstration of how the Hansard or the, the verbatim is done. Um, but just to, sh just to mention now that um, we have that list of events, if I can find the mouse, on the left-hand side, and the, at the bottom on the left-hand side, you can actually see the verbatim text as well. In the middle, you would have the list of all of the journal's events or all the minuted events. And then on the right-hand side, you would see the actual text of one of those. And so if you're one of the users and you want to and you're working on the minutes for that particular day, after you've created it, if you need to make any modifications, you could simply go over, choose the particular item that you wanted in the middle here, where it's highlighted in yellow, right click and say, edit XML, and you can see other things, the event details. If a member presents a petition, we have a specific module. Uh, you can link the, the, the minute entries to the Hansard entries or the verbatim, verbatim entries. But when you click on that edit XML, it actually brings up another, uh, just it's another tags view, and we're using XMetal as our uh, XML authoring tool as well, same as others as well. Um, again, another, this is a very simple example of some of the XML that we have. This is an actually a more interesting one, um, which I, I don't know if it'll be viewable here, but I'll explain it and I can show you on the web after, it might be a little bit easier, but. Um, this is an example from the journals, the House resumed consideration of the motion of Mr. Watson Essex. And it's hard to see on the screen here, and that's on, a little bit on purpose, but not necessarily for the purposes of this presentation. Um, but Mr. Watson's name has a dotted line underneath it, and so does Mr. Van Kestern underneath has a dotted line under it. And that's just indicating that those have got semantic tags around them. They're ta those members are tagged. The member information is available in the database, and if you were to click on that, it would pop up a little box, a little bit like what we have in the middle of the screen right there, and it would allow you to choose from the various sources of information about that member of parliament. Now, that's for members. We also have the same thing for documents, so for bills, if you click on uh, Bill C-305 uh, or the title of the bill, it would bring up this particular box here, either the Info, 
which is a web page that is uh, prepared by our Library of Parliament. Uh, who and they prepare a summary of each bill and they bring a lot of rich information including media clippings and stuff for the members and so we link to that from the journals as well as having a link directly to the text of the bill so bill information actually brings you to the bill itself um, the next example I'm going to show is how we do Hansard which is the edited transcript of the, uh, for the debates of the verbatim. So each time a member speaks, as I mentioned already, it's recorded as an intervention event. The digital audio was re recorded and aligned with all of those events, and the transcriber then requests a unit of work and receives an outline of those events. And I'll show you that quickly now. So on the floor of the House, this is what our, our seating plan looks like. Uh, and it's divided by party. This is quite an, actually quite an old version of the seating plan now. But uh, it's divided by, um, by parties with the different colors. And there's uh, people who sit right about here on the floor and they're watching and as members are recognized by the speaker they would simply click on the member's name and that would be recorded. And we actually use the exact same module for recording the votes. We don't have an electronic voting system. Uh, we have a roll call voting system and, um, but it's all recorded at the same time using the same module. So we uh, capture, capture it electronically as well. So once all of the interventions are captured like that using that floor plan event, um, about five minutes after the, the uh, first event is captured, uh, the first event of the day is captured, these events start to get bundled together. And what happens is, is that um, you have the list of events on the side. And as I said before, we do everything bilingually. And so uh, you can see that uh, here, for example, Peter Milliken, who's the Speaker of the House of Commons, uh, spoke in French and so it's marked in French and so here we have Francais, whoops, le président, the speaker and this is grayed out right now because the idea is that when you request a unit of work you only receive the unit of work that you want to, that if you're an Anglophone transcriber you only get the English bits and if you're a French transcriber you only get the French bits and so uh, this in this sample it happens to be a, a Francophone member of the staff who's going to be transcribing in French and uh, they receive their unit of work and then they go in and they have a simplified, they could have it with the tags off as well, but by default the tags are on. Um, and they simply go in and once again have a very simplified way of doing this. Now it's also, the DTD is a semantic DTD. This is a very simplified version of it, but if, if there had been references to other members, if there had been references to bills or other documents, then those could be also marked up in here as well. And then after, uh, oh, and I should mention as well, as I mentioned earlier, that the audio is also synchronized. So the events record everything in a moment in time. The audio is all available and playing. They have a little foot pedal to control all of that. And so they're listening and they're typing at the same time. And when they're done, they simply click save. And then you'll see somebody else may have been working. In this case, they were working in English. I was working in French in this demonstration. And then you see that everything is lined up and put together in the proper order. It then it's then set off for sent off for editing and for translation into the other language, a language other than the one that the member spoke in. Um, there's also, um, unfortunately, for lack of time, uh, didn't include it. But we also have uh, in the last few years. This has been a cumulative effort. As I said, it started in the project started in 1999. In, two, in September of 2000, we launched the first modules, uh, September 2001 rather, we launched the first modules, which were the Hansard modules in particular. But over time, we've just kept adding to those. And so uh, it, we started off small in a very concentrated area, uh, one that, uh, of course, is very, very high profile and uh, we needed to deliver. Uh, no, no room for risk there either. Um, but what happened was is that we've uh, over time gradually added more modules and one of the modules that we've added in the last few years more recently is an indexing module which allows the information management uh, office in information management officers to be able to go in and be able to further tag those using the DTD using the semantic markup language to be able to and the database uh, and the information in the database and the authority list that's in the database to be able to bring all that information together and to create a very very rich data source. Um, I think that we've already covered some of these things, why we've done open standards, but I will mention uh, just two things if I can. One is that uh, one of the big reasons that we went to XML, and we went to XML in 1999, so I mean we were very, very early adopters of it. Um, uh, but we really did have a strong desire to separate the content from the container. And so the idea of being able to produce multiple, uh, multiple um, formats of a document 
the print version is still our de facto standard, but to be able to do full uh, web layouts. Um, and also, more importantly, and we have, um, I can show this if anyone's interested, we have uh, accessibility requirements. Our Secretary General, our clerk, the clerk of the House of Commons, committed to uh, uh, accessibility standards uh, a number of years ago, and we've been, um, because of our use of XML, we've been able to largely meet those, and in fact, I would say fully meet those standards. Uh, and so that was an important benefit of going to XML early, is that we're now able to, to leverage it for being able to do those types of things later on. Um, I think I'll conclude with that. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, I would suggest that if there is a couple of questions uh, just for Jan's presentation, then I will do a, a two-minute not authorized summary of the session, and then we can uh, open again the floor for another five or ten minutes to get some, some feedback more general, and then the speaker can feel free to... Uh, to answer. So if there is a couple of questions uh, that for, for Jan's uh, uh, presentation or uh, I move to the unauthorized summary. Uh, Ian, uh, I don't know if you remember me. We met last February yeah. um, in the House of Commons in Canada. Um, when you discussed prison with me last time, it was still a very big uh, program with a team of people working on it. Um, my question again this year is prison is prison modular in any sense that could be exported to other parliaments or or is it still a number of different programs tied together to get it to for everything to work? It uh, it shares one common infrastructure um, so all the applications plug into one shell for the most part um, it's 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 very integrated. It's also highly customized. That's the other thing. Um, one thing that I should mention as well is I'm I'm not a technical person. I was assigned to the to the to this ICT project at the beginning, but I'm actually on the business side. And so one of the one of the important things that was done at the beginning of this project was bringing together both business and technical resources. Uh, to be able to deliver uh, uh, quite a complex project. And so a lot of, there was a lot of investment of, of not just technical skills, but business knowledge that goes, that went directly into the system. And as a result, it's a pretty highly customized application. So. Yes, uh, please. <coughs> please say your name and... Uh... Yes, of course. Uh, Shafiq Rachadi, uh, député du Parlement marocain. Nous avons aussi l'occasion... Vous avez tellement contribué avec, en tous les cas, le Parlement du Québec, euh, du Canada aussi, a, a, a vraiment contribué dans la mise en place du système informatique euh, marocain. Euh, bon, euh, C'est-à-dire, moi, j'aimerais bien résumer une chose. Tous les intervenants ont, ont utilisé deux P, c'est-à-dire la patience et la persévérance. Et moi, j'ajouterais un troisième P. Est-ce qu'il y a vraiment une prudence c'est-à-dire à prendre en considération en utilisant ces systèmes ou, 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 ou changement de système. Merci. Ben, peut-être moi je peux commencer. Je ne sais pas s'il si y a d'autres qui veulent qui a des commentaires aussi. Moi je veux dire oui, <rire> certainement. Euh, C'est un processus qui, qui prend assez longtemps pour le faire. Uh, pour développer un système comme n'importe quel système qu'on a vu aujourd'hui. Donc, je pense que la réponse est oui. OK, just, just the last question for, for Yann, please, you. Question un peu plus technique. Uh, les marqueurs sémantiques que vous générez, est-ce qu'ils sont générés manuellement ou automatiquement? Et éventuellement, est-ce que vous générez les marqueurs sémantiques à partir des, uh, des, des, de la voie digitalisée? Uh, je vais prendre la deuxième question en premier. Uh, non, on n'utilise pas, il uh, n'y a pas une façon de, de le faire pour nous autres aujourd'hui uh, pour traduire um, qu ce qui est dit en, 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 en balise sématique. Mais uh, donc, c'est la, de la deuxième question. La première question, c'est que uh, c'est une combi, combi, combinaison des deux. Uh, on utilise, uh, comme vous avez vu sur l'écran, uh, on utilise une base de données pour, pour générer beaucoup des, um, beaucoup des entrées dans les publications. Donc, 
d'une façon, c'est automatique parce que c'est le système qui va les générer, mais c'est seulement après que quelqu'un les, les a déjà identifiés. OK. Um, thank you. Now, really, just a, a couple of minutes to, 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 to I just kind of a thought for each of your presentation that definitely, as I said, is not an authorized summary of them, and so please forgive me. But I, I, starting with Christine, I think one of the points that I got from her presentation was, for instance, that it, it's one of the myths that we have to dispel, is that uh, when you adopt XML, uh, people confront with themselves with uh, uh, an incomprehensible kind of environment, and it's not true, you know. XML is uh, well hidden uh, behind uh, the, the application, as you have, you have, you have seen in both uh, Canada and, and in the U.S., so it's not, it, it, that is not really uh, the case. And uh, I also have, uh, as, you, as you know, there has been a lot of resistance uh, in using uh, the, the system in your, and also from the politicians themselves. And, and, and the drafters that are the ones that draft rules that we all have to follow, but are the first ones that don't want to follow any <laughs> rule. And so the best, uh, this is the lesson learned is parliament that want to tell us what we have to do. They don't want to be told by anybody what they should do. This is the first lesson learned that we have. Sergio, I think that the important thing of Sergio and what I got from Sergio is that uh, really, they took advantage of learning from other experience. Yeah. They didn't venture into it as nothing was done before. You know, they, 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 they took the, the, the cautious and the smart approach, actually. And so they look around to see what is the best experience. They send even somebody, actually, because Joao yeah. was sent seconded, actually, basically, even if he's doing a PhD. Uh, in uh, uh, what you call uh, legal informatics, University of Bologna, uh, to learn more and then and then apply. And so this is another thing that we should call keep in mind. You know, learn, not do not invent. You know, there is always smart people around. Uh, believe it or not, um, <laughs> Richard. I think that you uh, uh, also point out uh, uh, a way not to use XML. So not to use XML for a typographical setting, even if it's a quite useful uh, experience, as you have demo just said, and it can lead to accessibility issue, and, and so it, it's worthwhile, but definitely what characterizes XML is the semantic markup of the document, so uh, uh, that we should, uh, we should use. I think uh, another lesson learned from, uh, from what uh, uh, Richard replied, that is true that, you know, MP and parliamentarian, and you are one of them. Uh, sorry, uh, they, they all ask for the perfection, you know, and nothing can break. But we all see that Parliament have broken many, many things in their long life, and so uh, the lesson learned is Parliament asks for what they are not able to deliver, the perfect system. And this is the second <laughs> lesson learned. But, but it's true. We should we should accept the fact that you know even. But information system, you know, unless you don't take chance, you don't really can um, move ahead. And I think one of the important also lesson uh, or, or uh, lesson that uh, the UK Parliament took is the, the, their intention to publish the XML document. Uh, and that is a very important because that is a new frontier or uh, open standard. Allow people to reuse your own information. As you know, I, I don't know how many of but there is a site in UK called They Work For You that actually have been doing this, using the information published in HTML from the parliament, tagging AG, and then providing a Vadiali service. It's a civil, a civil society organization that really provides very useful information. And parliament has to move toward that, open up and be able, and accept the fact that people will do smart things about, and may at times not so, 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 so pleasant. Um, the presentation of Choi, uh, it was very interesting, I think, to see uh, how an integrating system with, I don't think you are using yet XML, but you are using extensively metadata uh, can deliver. And then I, I, uh, I imagine how powerful it could become once you, you move to the full, uh, full XML. And I think it's really an interesting uh, uh, example of how in a relatively short time, I'm saying, you come up with a system that is really comprehensive and really integrated. 
And um, uh, Jana, I think that uh, again you, to you took about the, the issue of isolating from the XML. That is really something that uh, you know keep away the user from that. And so, uh, final user shouldn't be afraid and shouldn't use. There is no excuse for the final user to say no. It's going to be difficult or complicated. And I think that the, the, the other lesson that they say that it takes time is very much is very much uh, an important lesson that we all all have to say. I just close my remarks saying that uh, it, it really open uh, open standard having open standard and not openly collaborating uh, among parliament is like having a Ferrari and keep it in a garage. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You know, because there is always to learn, and no matter how, you know, I always say even that no matter how powerful is your parliament, you can always learn even for a small parliament because there are something there that you can learn. And so I think that we should, yes, promote open standard, but we should really encourage, as you have done, for instance, pu publishing a, a more structured cooperation among all parliament. And now I don't know if we want to uh, give the floor to ask some question, and then I leave the, the presenter to, to respond to them. Please, madam. Aren't you? Yeah, please. Um, Carmen Bartolome from the Translation uh, Directorate in Parliament. I'm curious about, uh, it's a question for the US, uh, how did you um, convince the authors to migrate from Word into XML? And what kind, really, go into detail, please. They're, they're the strongest nation in the world, of course. You know, they have a lot of arms. Well, <laughs> it's really hard to convince attorneys to adopt anything. But we had a ledge council ahead of the office that was really understood the value of XML. And we really did take away some of the administrative chores for them, particularly in the renumbering. So if they... What I showed you was just a little tiny bill. This is a tiny, tiny bill. We have bills that are 800, 1,000 pages, and a drafter might draft one title, another drafter the second title, and when they merge it together, that administrative chore of creating the table of contents and making sure all the provisions are numbered correctly and the internal cross-references um, are correct was really time-consuming. And as we heard, we have to be quick. The, the speaker wants the legislation on the House floor they might have an hour sometimes to make that 800 page document and so we really um, made the tools to take away those administrative chores and after they used it for a while they they understood that they were getting to use more uh, to more of their time on the content in the legislative language and not this administrative things of of oh, I have to put this code here because it's all capitalized or oh, I have to type this header in but I have to go fix the table of contents and so we really were able to to do that we also used a phased in approach so that for many years they were using both the old system and the new and so we really just kind of the the older attorneys who've been drafting for maybe 10 or 15 20 years it really took them a long time to get into the new system and we didn't drag them we just gently nudged them <laughs> to get them to use the system but that smart authoring is the way to go um, really convince them that they're going to have a better work product than what they did before. Uh, please, the, the lady, yes. Please, please. Hello. Sí. Eh, siendo el Uruguay un país bicameral, contamos con un sistema único de información tanto para el Senado como para la Cámara de Representantes. Siendo país también del tercer mundo, encontramos muy interesante en su momento cuando visitamos el Parlamento inglés la experiencia que nos transmitieron ellos sobre el trabajo en conjunto de los dos cuerpos. Y entonces nos preguntamos, y esta pregunta no puede ir para el representante inglés como para cualquiera de los miembros que están en la mesa. Y sobre la parte inicial, en las iniciativas vemos que en todos la parte de metadatos se viene desde el vamos con la iniciativa. ¿Qué pasa con la parte post? Sobre aquellos metadatos que se incluyen luego de finalizada, luego que el proyecto se convierte en ley, los metadatos a posteriori. Es decir, ¿tenemos que pensar en una tercera organización más allá de la Cámara del Senado o es viable 
que ambos cuerpos, sin pensar en una tercera, porque en Estados Unidos sí tienen, tienen la biblioteca, pero nosotros seríamos reticentes a pensar en una tercera y entendemos que es muy bueno y es ejemplarizante ver que algunos lo logren solamente a través de la Cámara y el Senado, especialmente para nuestros países bicamerales y subdesarrollados. ¿Es viable pensar, tiene una solución por la cual podamos lograr un sistema único también para estos metadatos a posteriori a través de las propias cámaras? No sé si está clara la pregunta. Estos especialistas en la información que de alguna forma trabajen en forma armoniosa, de acuerdo, de conformidad entre ambos, Cámara y Senado. Especialmente la pregunta naturalmente va para el representante inglés porque trabaja mucho en políticas comunes, por lo que vi están pensando en estrategias, etcétera. Están trabajando desde up-down, top-down en esto, pero puede ir para cualquiera de ustedes. Gracias. We, uh, so sorry, we are running out of time. We just take one question and then we do a, a one minute each of you, if you to, to sum up. Okay. Do you want to? Yes, if you. So, uh, well, on that specific question, um, sorry. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, the software which is used to create bills and which is then used for the final text as acts is actually a tripartite system which is used by the Parliamentary Council who work for the government and also by the clerks of both houses. But the strongest partner in that uh, consortium is the government. So uh, if we're going to make some changes in that system, and what you uh, indicate I think would be very logical, we really do need to bring the government with us. And that's something we're working on, but we haven't succeeded yet. Okay, really, we don't have time. I don't know, Jan, if you want to say something to close, just uh, uh, 30 seconds, a minute, whatever conclusion, or... Joy, Christian. The only thing I would say is that there is additional information... I'm sorry. There's additional information about our, our information on our PowerPoint presentation, so once that gets posted, there's more detail in there. Okay. Sergio and uh, Richard... Uh, one of the benefits of using open standards is like uh, we, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking and planning what to do. And then the implementation uh, phase was really fast. Uh, we just got out, out of the shelf, almost like that, components, put it together, and really this, this things happen very fast. All this search engine I showed you is completely built on open system. Thank you. Perhaps if, if I could just make one very final uh, brief point. It's on the question of um, how do we get people to use these new tools. For the system that I was describing, which is very new, it's only going live next week, we actually had the software developers sitting in the journal office with the journal clerks developing the prototypes and commenting on them week by week. And that technique of agile development seems to be quite powerful. And if it works this time, we'll certainly use it again. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, but we really have to move quickly to the other session. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, without uh, further ado, we get started for the last session, which is devoted to uh, parliamentary documents in a regional context. How can open standards promote uh, harmonization? And uh, we have... Uh, So we have learned uh, from, uh, from the previous session that um, um, open standards are now, are now available. Uh, many results have already been obtained. Uh, legislative standards are available at the national, supranational, regional level. We have also systems that um, um, enable... Uh, uh, pa One minute. I mean, people are still coming in and out. Okay, so uh, 
I was saying that um, uh, we have seen that uh, legislative standards are available at the national, supranational, regional level, and we have also systems uh, that enable uh, parliaments to draft, uh, manage, distribute uh, documents uh, compliant with standards. And um, you have also observed that there is a lot of convergence on what has been done. Many parliaments are doing the same things, uh, defining standards, <coughs> developing tools for drafting standards compliant documents, developing document management system for storing and searching such documents, and, uh, and so on. I think that this is good since uh, it shows that uh, we are going in, in the right direction. But one may wonder whether we are duplicating or multiplying efforts, and maybe there are opportunities for cooperation and synergies that are not fully exploited. So we need to consider, I think, whether it is possible, while preserving everyone's autonomy, to integrate efforts and profit from other people's experience, share documents, but also tools, and possibly develop joint projects at a transnational, at a transnational level. Um, open standards, I think this will emerge from the following presentation, can contribute to regional cooperation, because having common or interoperable standards facilitates exchanges of documents and information and new form of, of cooperation. So cooperation can also contribute to open standards. Um, we need to agree, to agree at the regional on common or interoperable standards, ensure common ownership and develop um, exchanges, uh, synergies, and cooperation. This is, will be the focus of the present session, uh, we will, where we will uh, consider the connection between open standards um, and the regional cooperation. Um, uh, we will have uh, Peter Brown from OASIL, who will uh, illustrate uh, advancement uh, in the development of shared standards. And then we will have uh, uh, two uh, presentations focusing on uh, two different uh, uh, standards uh, which are above uh, the national level. Tom Van Engels will focus on um, um, Metalex, which is uh, an exchange standard for uh, XML documents, uh, which enables XML legislative documents uh, developed according to different standards in different countries or within the same country being exchanged, being shared. And Monica Palmirani will uh, introduce instead um, uh, a commentoso, which is uh, a standard for uh, uh, African Parliament, uh, which is supported uh, by the Pan-African Parliament. I stop at this point uh, since uh, there is very little time for our session, and um, I give uh, uh, the floor to the first speaker, which is Peter Brown from Oasis. Peter? Okay, are you ready? with standards. Is it funziona, Monica? Ah. I have it I have it here if you want. The beauty of standards of course is there's so many of them as we see now. Um, yep, if we can just switch the laptops over, it's probably the easiest. And assuming my one lets me in. nothing to do with Windows, it's <laughs> probably with yeah, the, the wrong version of Acrobat, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It should, it's it coming. Should, there we go. Yes, yes. Okay. So I'll that problem. And, uh, yeah, they have software that is very old on that computer. Okay. 
Well, there we saw standards and interoperability in action. Very literally, um, getting from what I finished as a presentation earlier today to getting that projected onto the screen, there's something like 27 different standards involved, both from the, from the actual software used to generate the presentation right through to the dimensions and the projection quality on the screen here. Um, the fact that I'm not able to use my presentation on one of the PCs was a problem because interoperability and standards are not the same thing. And that's something I want to look at a little bit. Anyway, with that slightly elegant way to, to get across the fact that we had a typical uh, mess up in the, in, in the, in the changeover, um, what I want to talk about a little bit is my own experience. I mean, I have a background in the European Parliament, working with data standards, worked with Flavio and others on the UNDESA project in Africa, on uh, Pan-African um, uh, parliamentary capacity building over the last few years. And more recently, on unpaid leave, I've set up my own company, and I also work now as or um, elected member of the board of directors for OASIS, one of the larger open standards consortia in the world. What I want to look at is three questions. The, the why, the what, and the how of standards and what that means in the regional context and of uh, working with parliamentary documents and documentation systems. Why should we develop and use standards? We've heard and we've seen in the last session and from the earlier sessions in the conference already the